Let's continue. The following situation contrasts with that brief moment of peace. The devil, who never sleeps, arranged that at that very moment there entered the inn the same barber from whom Don Quixote had taken Mambrino's helmet and Sancho Panza the trappings that he had exchanged with those of his ass. Just like the shepherd boy Andres, the second barber arrives to check the heroisms of the Mad Knight and his squire, reminding us of one of their most serious crimes. Sancho turns violent. He gave the barber a punch to the face that bathed his teeth in blood. The barber cries out for help from the representatives of the law. Hark, king and justice. And he accuses Sancho of being a thief and a highway robber, even using the honorific Don to call him Sir Thief. He demands that Sancho return his brass or copper basin, which he estimates to be worth one escudo, and also his riding saddle, albarda, adding that if they do not believe him, there's my ass in the stable who will not let me lie. Cervantes here refers to a folk tale in which an ass is placed on the witness stand, but I wager he is also reminding us of his novel's most complicated trope, Sancho's still missing donkey. And if this is not chaotic enough, now both Don Quixote and Sancho remind us, if we are attentive readers, that in point of fact, Mambrino's helmet no longer exists. First, Don Quixote steps forward, and I swear by my professed order of chivalry that this helmet was the same one that I took from him, neither adding nor removing any of its aspects. Sancho adds more. There's no doubt about that, because from the moment my lord defeated him until now, he has only fought one battle when he freed those hapless men in chains. And were it not for this bashelmet, it would have gone badly for him, for there were many stones thrown in that encounter. Notice how impossible all of this is. Sancho has even invented a new word, bathielmo, and our heroes have pointed us back to the passage in the novel in which yet another student had smashed to pieces the Hidalgo's already at that time quite questionable helmet. If we are good students, and if we read closely the passage to which Sancho refers, we will find clear evidence that Mambrino's bachelmet, or whatever we call it, was dissolved 21 or 22 chapters ago, depending on whether or not we count chapter 43. At that time, a Latin student went up to Don Quixote and took the basin from his head and gave him three or four blows with it about his shoulders and smashed it as many times on the ground until he shattered it. Having finished chapter 44 with the dilemma of Sancho's neologism, the bashelmet, what comes next? But of course, chapter 35. Oh my God, that's right. In the novel's first edition, we read the following. Chapter 35, in which are resolved the doubts surrounding Mambrino's helmet and the saddle, and other adventures that occurred in all truthfulness. Ha, yes, you heard right, in all truthfulness. And for academic super nerds, here's another surprise. Not only does this direct us to the real chapter 35, which contains the radical interruption of the novel of the curious impertinent with Cervantes' most explicit reference to Apuleius' The Golden Ass, now Cervantes offers us an odd reference to the text he always considered the principal honor of his writings. When Don Quixote insists on his opinion regarding Membrino's helmet, saying, and anyone who says otherwise, I'll have him know he is lying, he echoes Cervantes's sonnet at the tomb of King Philip II in Seville, a brutal satire of the harmful effects of Habsburg power in Spain. Let's focus on the political turn already announced by the legalistic tone of these chapters, allusions to the king's representatives, and the image of Don Quixote as a puppet taken from Plato's Republic reach a climax in the public debate over the bashelmet, which for its part results in a struggle between two factions of guests. Against the second barber and in defense of Don Quixote, our barber, 
says that he knows a thing or two about the instruments of Barbary concluding that this piece, not only is it not a barber's basin, it's as far from being one as is white far from being black and truth from lies. However, he adds wryly that although it is a helmet, it's not a full helmet. By contrast, the mocked barber remains incredulous. The discussion focuses on how to distinguish between tricks and truths. This is one of the clearest examples of Cervantes' famous perspectivism, which anticipated postmodern relativism by over 300 years. Cervantes lets the first joke fly from the mouth of Don Quixote. First, the mocked barber becomes sarcastic. If this basin is a helmet, then this saddle must also be a stallion's pillion. Don Quixote's short, ingenuous answer is hilarious. It looks like a saddle to me. Funnier still is his indecision. I cannot make a definitive judgment, which suggests that the nature of reality is in the eye of the beholder. Next, the debate takes a doubly political turn. First, Don Fernando decides to resolve the issue democratically. I will take a secret poll of the votes of these gentlemen, and I will make a full and clear report of the results. Second, those who oppose the vote are specifically associated with the ominous presence of the state. This seemed to them to be the greatest nonsense on earth, especially to the four servants of Don Luis and to none other than Don Luis himself, as well as to three other travelers recently arrived at the inn who had the appearance of being officers of the Holy Brotherhood, which in effect they were. In the end, the vote goes against the second barber, and the process seems to have been fraudulent. For Don Fernando went about here and there tallying the votes, whispering into their ears so that they would secretly declare whether the prize was a saddle or a pillion. Don Fernando reports that unfortunately for you and your ass, this is a pillion, not a saddle. And moreover, it's even that of a pure-blooded stallion. In response, the barber lets fly with an anti-monarchist phrase, so go the laws, etc., and I've got nothing more to say. The whole refrain is, so go the laws, as go the kings. In other words, there's no such thing as true justice, only the prevailing wishes of the king. Tyranny. Is this laughable light satire or serious political criticism? Perhaps both.